All right. Now, all right, everyone. Um, welcome to the Sustainable Water Networks River Series. I'm Kristen Wolf, the coordinator for the Sustainable um, Water Network, which is basically a network or coalition of over 30 organizations that have been focusing on river issues, uh, specifically river flows. Um, we've tried to change Arizona water law by um, trying to get a watershed health bill included in these water laws. And that would have allowed some water to remain in our rivers. It would have recognized the connection between groundwater pumping and river flows. And it also would have required some watershed health assessments and surveys, which would have given us some useful information such as e-flows or environmental flows, or basically the amount of water that's required to sustain our rivers and all the life they support. Um, this watershed health data is missing from most of Arizona rivers. Um, this bill has been denied hearings for the last four years, but we will continue to try, along with some public outreach and public education, such as this river series. So tonight we have Gary Beverly talking about the values, threats, and protection of the Verde River. And a little bit about Gary. Um, Gary's a longtime activist for rivers, especially for the Birdie River. In addition to being an active steering committer for committee member for the Sustainable Water Network, he has also been past president and public policy committee chair of the Citizens Water Advocacy Group, which focuses on a more sustainable future in the Prescott um, active management area. He's also chair of the Yavapai Group of the Sierra Club and is also a member of the executive committee of the Grand Canyon chapter of the Sierra Club. And he's involved with groundwater pumping issues in the Big Chino Valley and its potential effects on the Verde River, as well as working towards getting the Upper Verde River recognized as a wild and scenic river. He is a tireless advocate for this amazing Arizona River. So we thank you, Gary, for talking about this river tonight. Great, thanks for the introduction, Kristen. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen and get this set up. Um, and um, let's see. So there you should see the title slide at this point. <clears throat> So I want to talk to you tonight about the Upper Verde Wild and Scenic River. And uh, the photo here is of uh, uh, Del, the, uh, no, this is Rio, the male bald eagle that nests at Del Rio Springs, the traditional headwaters of the Verde River. <clears throat> so the words there, explore, enjoy and protect are part of the motto of the Sierra Club. And it kind of traces my own experience with the river. In 2006, I retired and I just started getting back into the, into the woods and the natural environment and hiking. And I explored the river. I walked the length of the upper river. I really enjoyed it. And then I thought, this is an amazing place. I need to protect it. And I wanna point out that, that, and that's what I wanna talk about tonight is protecting this river, why it's valuable and uh, what we can do to protect it. I'm joined in this protection effort <clears throat> by hundreds of other people and thousands of citizens that really care that this special place is uh, protected and can endure. <clears throat> it's not just me alone by any means. So um, let's uh, kind of get oriented here. The, the, the Verde River is a green artery pulsing through the heart of Arizona. So here's the headwaters up near Paulden, Arizona, and it flows east and then southeast and south. And so Scottsdale is down here. Uh, the Verde joins the Salt River just east of Scottsdale. Moving upriver, this is Horseshoe Reservoir. 
Here's the uh, Verde Wild and Scenic River designated in 2009, um, in uh, 1980. Uh, and here's the Fossil Creek Wild and Scenic River designated in 2009. Um, this is the, the Verde Wild and Scenic River. So right now, Arizona has two wild and scenic rivers. Here's the Verde Valley, an urbanized area, and the river flows through the middle of it. And here is the Upper Verde River. It's the area between Clarkdale and Paulden. It's uh, little known, underappreciated, sort of remote, hard to get to. Um, and that's the area that we wanna protect. It's important to protect the headwaters of a river because everything flows downstream. So um, I wanna point out that this uh, river is a really important corridor that has five wilderness areas, eight inventory roadless areas, three national forests, two wild and scenic rivers, two state parks, one wildlife preserve, one national monument for a total of 530,000 contiguous protected acres next to the river. We've already made a huge investment in this watershed and now we need to cap it off by protecting the headwaters. And here the main thing I wanna talk about is connectivity. This river is a continuous 194 mile long riparian habitat linking the Sonoran Desert with the uh, Central Highlands. And here connectivity is the key. So geologic connectivity is part of it. The Verde watershed lies within a transition zone that is between the Colorado Plateau and the Basin and Range. These uh, are two major geologic provinces in North America. The Colorado Plateau is characterized by the layer cake of sedimentary rocks you see exposed in the Grand Canyon. And uh, the Basin and Range Province is characterized by um, mountain ranges and, and valleys in between um, uh, and basalt rocks. The Basin and Range extends from uh, here um, to uh, west to the Sierra Nevada and north from the Pinacate Desert up into Idaho. So there's a transition zone between these two provinces. Um, and the transition zone includes characteristics of each of those two geologies. Colorado Plateau is characterized by uh, limestones and sandstones, um, alkaline soils. The basin and range of volcanic rocks are more acidic. The transition zone has both. The Verde watershed has topography resulting from the plate tectonics that, that um, occur at the boundary of these um, provinces. It has um, water, it has different soils, it has thousands of different microhabitats that make it a really special place for biodiversity. And as a matter of fact, this watershed has some of the highest biodiversity in the Southwest. To see what that means in another sense, uh, here's the Verde watershed in the middle. And uh, so these are uh, echo regions in the Southwest, the Sonoran Desert, the Apache Highlands, the Arizona, New Mexico mountains, the Colorado Plateau, and it's rubbing elbows with the Mojave Desert. So, these five major ecoregions, that is collections of flora and fauna that uh, share a common environment. These five ecoregions, the major ecoregions in the southwestern United States and Mexico, surround the Verde watershed. So it has a little piece of the action from each one, another condition that explains the huge biodiversity. So although this watershed has only um, a little less than 6% of Arizona's land area. It has 78% of the breeding bird species, 25 of 28 Arizona bats, 17 of 19 Arizona carnivores, five of six ungulates and a lot of lizards and snakes. The photos here is the bald eagle, a javelina, uh, a river otter, super cute, and a beaver dam. <clears throat> These two are umbrella species for the, um, uh, watershed. So why do we have such high vertebrate di diversity? Because in an arid environment, over three quarters of the species depend on riparian habitats for some or all of their life cycle. 
It's just an ecological rule of thumb. And for, in geologic terms, that transition zone provides topography, different soils and aquifer, flowing water, creating thousands of microhabitats. So the Verde is hugely important to the state's wildlife. In terms of endangered species, this is one of the ESA listed uh, garter snakes. It's a peregrine falcon. This is a um, uh, yellow-billed cuckoo, an ESA listed species. Here's a bald eagle, which is taken off the endangered species list in uh, 2008, I think. And here's kind of one of my favorites. This is a belted kingfisher, just a little riparian bird that flies up and down the river at a high rate of speed squawking. I, I like him because he's got a very punk hairdo. So the point here is that in terms of endangered species, the Verde River supports a rich variety of plants, animals, and fish. 21 species in the Verde watershed are listed under the ESA. And there are an additional 16 sensitive species and species of concern. So this watershed is really key to wildlife. In terms of fish, um, of Arizona's 33 native fish, three are extinct, 19 are protected by the Endangered Species Act and the Verde supports 10, including four ESA listed native fish with critical habitat. Very, very important. This is a razorback sucker. That's one of the uh, ESA listed fish with critical habitat in the upper Verde. There's a spike dace, another one. This is a round tail chub, um, which is uh, a lot of them in the upper Verde. These are a candidate for listing. This is a, a Sonora sucker, a bottom feeding. I love this guy, his mouth. Uh, a bottom feeding um, uh, fish lives on macroinvertebrates and periphyton. So um, these, Desert, this, this Sonora sucker, these things can get to 30 inches long. Uh, they used to be common throughout the Southwest. Now they're found only in a few streams and the Verde is one of those. So um, native fish uh, are, are really important feature of the wildlife values on the river. Why? Well, because the habitat's been lost. Of Arizona's six major perennial rivers, Dams and groundwater pumping have consumed the Colorado, Gila, Salt, and Santa Cruz River. The San Pedro is struggling for life, and that leaves the Verde as the last one standing. The Verde River is the longest surviving living river in our state. By living river, I mean that it has perennial flow, that it has natural vegetation on its banks, and then it has a natural flood flow cycle. These are the uh, requirements to have a healthy uh, riparian um, environment. So to protect this, um, in 2011, the Sierra Club published the citizen's proposal for an upper Verde Wild and Scenic River. This was product of three years work by um, about 10 people uh, working on a steering committee and uh, citizens, members of various conservation organizations. And it was predominantly a Sierra Club effort. Um, so I wanna talk to you some about the Upper Verde Wild and Scenic River proposal. This has been sitting on the shelf since 2011, but now circumstances have changed and we have an opportunity to really make some good things happen. So what's in this proposal? Um, so here's a map that outlines um, five segments for the river. Segment one is lower 1.6 miles of Granite Creek, a uh, uh, tributary far up in the upper river. Uh, that's red because we're proposing that for wild status. Um, here's another wild segment, number two. Segment three is a scenic segment in blue. This wild segment is the lower four miles of Sycamore Creek and it lies within the Sycamore Canyon wilderness area. And this segment five is a recreational segment that extends from Sycamore Creek down to the southeastern boundary of Prescott National Forest. So it's 50.2 miles, it includes 11,605 acres. 
Now these classifications are defined by the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So a wild class river um, has very little uh, evidence of human intrusion uh, and presence on it. Um, a scenic river is, has some degree of uh, human intrusion and development on the banks and a recreational river uh, permits even more bankside development. So the terms wild and scenic and uh, recreational uh, when used as classifications for wild and scenic rivers don't mean what the words would normally mean to you. Um, and, and so a recreational river can be very scenic and you can have a lot of recreation in a wild river. These terms refer to the level of bankside development along the river. So um, we've got a good proposal here that's very well justified. And um, we've done some interesting things with it. The boundary of a wild and scenic river, um, conventionally, um, it goes a quarter mile on each side of the high water mark. So it would be kind of a following the river down, it'd be like a half mile line a uh, half mile wide swath that, that follows, um, that's centered on the river. And, but we've done something different here. Um, we've used a physiographic boundary, which is a, a rim to rim boundary, uh, relying on contour lines. And so some examples of that are here. Um, so um, here's the Verde River in the blue. And uh, this is actually Hell Canyon that comes in. This is a intermittent stream that drains the south side of Bill Williams Mountain. So the orange lines here would be our half mile wide swath, a quarter mile each side of the, 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 the river. And in this case, you can see that for the red line is our proposed wild river boundary and it's well inside the default uh, quarter mile from the bank boundary. And that is because um, we wanted to e make it easier for the Forest Service to manage this river and we wanted to stay out of the way of the ranchers. This, this uh, flat rim tableland up here is uh, part of grazing leases in Prescott National Forest. And to for, and, and so what we care about is the riparian zone down on the river. Um, and the Forest Service is gonna have its hands full managing that. Why should we force them to come up and manage a few hundred yards on the rim? And in doing so, have to interact with the ranchers. And, and so the ranching community is a high potential source of opposition to this. So basically we're trying to stay out of their way by restricting the boundaries to what counts. Now, in some areas, we've actually um, expanded the boundary past the quarter mile point to take advantage of important physiographic features that are important wildlife habitats. So it cuts both ways. So this allows us to do a better job, a more precise uh, definition of the boundary of a proposed wild and scenic river. Another, um, another issue is that um, we wanna stay out of the way of private property. So this is a, an area at Perkinsville Bridge. This is about mile 25 on the river. Perkinsville Bridge is right here at mile 25. And so what we've done is to restrict the uh, boundary of the river to the 100 year floodplain and in so doing, stay out of the way and see how much we're avoiding annoying these ranch landowners. And this is actually, um, this particular ranching group of ranchers is, is uh, somebody we, we, we'd like to cooperate. <laughs> um, so by using these flexible boundaries, we minimize the intrusion into, the, into ranching and we minimize the impact on private property and um, reduce the objections to this uh, wild and scenic river designation. So, um, you know, we, we respect ranchers and their presence there. Um, 
the permitted grazing areas along the rim are excluded from the wild and scenic river boundary. And um, grazing in the riparian zone is already prohibited since 1993. So the ranchers aren't gonna lose anything there. And this uh, Wild and Scenic River uh, will improve the control of illegal off-highway vehicle traffic. This is a major irritant for ranchers because high, off-highway vehicle riders, um, rogue riders come in and cut fences, leave gates open. Um, they're a real problem. So um, trying to work with the ranchers to make this uh, Wild and Scenic River work for everyone. So what are the effects of a wild and scenic river on private property? Well, for one, if private property is included in a wild and scenic river, there is no requirement for public access. So a rancher doesn't have to let the public into his land just because it's a wild and scenic river. Um, the wild and scenic river managers have no control over private land use. This photo is actually of Perkinsville Ranch and the river's over here in the trees. But say, suppose the rancher put in a huge manure pile or something here that was affecting water quality on the river. The, the manager could go and say, hey, look, this is a problem. Let us help you work with this and clean this up to help the river. But the manager could not go in and say, you're in violation and you have to cut this out. So um, there's no control over private land use. And then once again, this will give better control of illegal off-highway vehicle impacts. Wild and scenic rivers have impacts on water rights. And this is usually one of the most serious objections to wild and scenic rivers. So um, Congress has to designate this river as a wild and scenic river. And so both houses of Congress and signed by the president, um, this shows up as a amendment to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. <clears throat> when it is designated, it creates uh, a federal in-stream flow right that uh, it vests on the designation date. That is, its priority date is the date that Congress authorized the Wild and Scenic River. So that in-stream flow right is subject to the Arizona State Water Management uh, laws. And Arizona has a priority system for surface water. So the first right, the earliest right, has the uh, first, uh, first dibs on the river water. Um, so the federal in-stream flow right is, in this case, would be junior to many, many other rights on the river. And so it won't affect existing prior surface or groundwater rights, upstream or downstream. It might affect subsequent rights, um, but it has no effect on existing right holders. So you may wonder, well, geez, if, if you're gonna protect a river, shouldn't the river have some rights? And yeah, it should. But really, practically speaking, if, designated in a wild and scenic river harmed existing rights, we would never have seen a Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968. Um, there's just some compromises that are inevitable. So the bottom line is that wild and scenic river designation does not guarantee stream flow, and it does not constrain out of boundary groundwater pumping. This is uh, an important point that I want to come back in the last uh, segment of this uh, talk. So what will it do? It recognizes the Upper Verde River as a national treasure and the kind of that status and that recognition will make it easier for us to protect it against other um, uh, takings and issues. It prevents federal water projects, diver diversions, mining and roads. It maintains a free flowing water quality and quantity within the Wild and Scenic River boundary, and it requires a comprehensive resource management plan. The Wild and Scenic River Act requires that act to, that plan to be created within three years from the date of designation. 
And, it, and that management plan requires public input, stakeholder input. So um, we've just gone through that process with Fossil Creek, which was designated in 2009, and they just finished it last year. And um, it was a huge struggle. And don't get me started on that one, but um, it didn't turn out exactly like we wanted, but um, there is a process and the key, this management plan, it sounds sort of geeky, but it's really the key to the subsequent management and character of this wild and scenic river. So this is a really important thing. Even after we get this designated by Congress, this turns into a huge um, amount of work and a really critical and important part of uh, protecting this public resource. That management plan has to contain um, measures that will, that it requires the non-degradation or improvement of ORVs. So that stands for Outstanding Remarkable Values. And um, each segment of the river has to have outstanding and remarkable values. And these are defined in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act as scenic, um, I've shown you photos, I think we qualify there. Recreational, uh, here's a photo of some folks on one of my river hikes crossing the river. Um, hiking isn't the only thing, there's bird watching, hunting, hiking, uh, boating, uh, photography. Um, I don't know, there's a whole list, that's only a part of it. You know, we're making more people and we're not making more land. There's a always growing demand for recreational facilities. So this is a really important component of this river. Uh, there's geology is an important, uh, outstanding remarkable value. Historical and cultural values are important. This photo here is a roofed ruin and on the, um, we're facing north, uh, looking across Sycamore Canyon, Sycamore Creek, in the wilderness. And there's, there's I, I think, 70 something sites on in this proposal that would qualify for inclusion in the National Historic Register. The whole river has been a rich quarter for um, Native people, for uh, hunting and living and, and, and traveling for tens of thousands of years. And they've left behind a lot of evidence of that. It's really a fascinating part of uh, learning about this river. Another ORV is wildlife and fish. I've talked about those. And then the ecological importance, the fact that this, this watershed is bridging five echo regions and two geologic transition zones. Um, this is a real unique feature. So the Verde has wild and scenic rivers. Uh, while, the Verde Wild and Scenic River has outstanding and remarkable values in abundance. If, if Congress had envisioned a river, if they'd had a, 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 a picture of a river in their mind when they created the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, the Verde could have been it. This thing fits so perfectly, and so naturally. This is, this ought to be a perfect fit. So in the citizens proposal and the process, <clears throat> we talked a lot with, okay, here's a bunch of abbreviations, Prescott National Forest, Coconino National Forest, Arizona Game and Fish Department, Salt River Project, the Nature Conservancy, US Fish and Wildlife Service and ranchers. Tried to talk with all the stakeholders, explain to them what we're doing, answer their questions and incorporate uh, their specific concerns. And we have done that. Um, this process was particularly important with Prescott National Forest. Um, I was meeting with their planners and with the uh, forest supervisor um, several times a month for a couple of years. And uh, trying to make them understand what we're doing and why and why it was so important so when they needed to re revise the forest plan, the Prescott National Forest Plan, they were, were required by Forest Service policy to um, 
study the eligibility of uh, the Verif as a wild and scenic river. And they did that and they determined it was eligible and their eligibility study tracked the citizens proposal 95%. I mean, they're very close. We uh, included some rivers that were out of the boundaries of Prescott National Forest and they didn't have to, so they didn't. So there's a few obvious differences, but we, we tracked very closely. So I think all those meetings and that time I invested in working with them really paid off. And it's really paid off because this was a very significant thing. When the Forest Service declares the river eligible for status, Forest Service policy then requires the forest to manage the river as a default wild and scenic river. And they've been doing that now, sort of, since 2010. So this achieved, this step right here on the screen, achieved substantial protection for the river. And this, this was, this was a great and good thing. So we have achieved some protection, but there are many threats to the river. And I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about the threats. One threat is trespass grazing. And we've been struggling with this for years. The Center for Biological Diversity, CBD, has filed litigation in uh, Arizona courts against uh, almost all the Arizona forests. The settlements uh, for those suits, uh, CBD won basically. Um, the, the, well, the, the lawsuit alleged that the Forest Service was not adequately controlling trespass grazing. Cattle grazing in riparian areas is maybe the most destructive thing you can do short of taking all the water out of the river. They uh, eat uh, the grass, they trample the, trample the banks, they uh, foul the water, they chew off seedling trees. Um, it has an enormous effect on the riparian habitat. So CBD filed suit, won the suit, and now the settlement agreements are forcing the forest to do uh, tremendously increased monitoring activities on the forest. I've been getting some of these monitoring reports for the Verde and uh, they, uh, they're doing a good job. They're, they're responding to what they agreed to do in the settlement and they're doing a good job. But the Forest Service just doesn't have the staff to do all this. These cows, these critters, when they see the green forage in the water, they'll break down a fence and walk through it and go down there. It's, this is gonna be a continual maintenance issue. And uh, so the, the Yavapai group of the Sierra Club actually has a volunteer agreement with the forest to assist with monitoring pastures, uh, with monitoring the river corridor that are next to pastures that are being occupied. Um, so the cattle are not permitted in the riparian zone, but they bust through the fences and get in there. So we could use some help, um, people that can hike into remote regions and spend the day walking along looking for trespass cattle, that would really help the river and it helps the Forest Service. Another threat is destructive recreation. I, in, in the 2008, nine and 10, I saw a lot of this. Uh, the Forest Service had an existing policy to prevent uh, off-highway vehicles in the river. They weren't enforcing it. It took me three years of chewing on them. Um, to, to get that fixed. And so now that problem is largely under control. Uh, we have a few leaks from the uh, barriers at trailheads, but uh, basically we've made a lot of progress getting the uh, vehicles out of the river. Um, the careless campers thing has been uh, an ongoing issue. Uh, this particular scene is at Perkinsville Bridge and you know, it's, it's pretty ugly. You've got not, not just an illegal fire pit and trash and beer cans, but the banks are compacted. The streamside vegetation is, is trampled. Um, the green trees are cut. Campers have really mistreated this area. And, and this is something I just wanna talk a little bit, more, little bit more about briefly. Uh, basically lax management by Prescott Forest created a public health hazard. This is uh, 
what the river near uh, Perkinsville Bridge ought to look like. This is what it wound up looking like. This is a user created road. They broke down barriers and signs and drove down in there and completely compacted a couple of acres of riparian habitat, you drive their cars in, you see the chainsaw, that's to cut green trees for their campfires. Here's an example of that. Um, here you see on the other side of the river that's unoccupied, that's, that's not accessible, you can see what it should look like and you can see what it looks like here. The riverbank's been trampled um, and the vegetation is gone. So now you've got erosion. So now the tree roots are exposed and then they've come in and sawed off the tree roots of these riparian trees for firewood. So um, this is a problem. This is what it ought to look like. That's what the Wild and Scenic River Act requires them to manage for. So there's been a lot of illegal shooting down there, um, building of uh, rock dams, uh, tire swings, graffiti. I mean, this place has just been trashed. Each of the little markers represents the pile of human feces that I discovered. Uh, spread along the campsites uh, there by the river. Um, well, this was just a tremendous health hazard. When I showed this map to the Forest Service, they started to get the idea and we started getting some action. Um, this was so bad, the Sierra Club paid out of our own funds for a porta potty to be put in there just to control this. Um, that helped a lot. What we determined was that. Uh, the useful range of a porta potty is 600 feet. And so if you've got to walk more than 600 feet, they're not going to do it. <laughs> Finally, got through to the district ranger and the forest supervisor, and we've got this area closed off now. There's no more camping in there. That happened last October. It's been um, tremendously successful. The area is clean, there's no more human waste spread around. Um, all those deleterious impacts have been tremendously reduced. But we're coming up in now into a season where people want to come out and camp as it warms up in the spring. I think, uh, you know, we the Sierra Club wants to monitor this and kind of put some greeters in there to talk to people and explain why we've we've had to get this closed off. When I found that when I do that, people understand and they're very supportive of it. And then they learn why the river is important. So uh, we're open to volunteers for uh, uh, greeters at this campground this, on weekends this, this summer. So after the gates got put in, we did a cleanup party and we're painting out their graffiti and picking up the trash. And we had a great time down there. This. Uh, this in late April, we're going to have a, uh, uh, a party down there at uh, Perkinsville Bridge to uh, celebrate the, the renovation, plant some trees, have some music, have some uh, blessings for the river. Um, and so if, if I'll get publicity out on that and people are welcome to come help us celebrate uh, restoring an important part of the river. But the bottom line is the federal government cannot fully protect this river. They don't have the staff to really do, uh, to ride herd on the cattle. They don't have the staff to ride herd on the people. Um, and so, by the way, this particular view is important. This also is where Hill Canyon comes in. And um, what we're, what, this is one of the spots that would dry up if we don't control groundwater pumping. Um, is a shot in the fall. You can see the fall color. This is uh, um, the Sycamore Wilderness Area and Sycamore Canyon back here. And this is Kasner Mountain. And so Sedona would be up in here. So the one thing that the federal government cannot do, even if they had the staff, is to control the water. I want to talk about the crisis and flow on the river. What we're seeing is record low flows over since for 60 years. This is the Paulden 
stream gauge operated by the U.S. Geological Society. It measures river flow. And in June 2021, it was down to 13.3 CFS. Here's the trend line. Since 1996, the lowest seven day annual flows in the river has been steadily declining. And uh, we have, I have a lot of other graphs I could show on this, but not to belabor the point. This is a climate change signal, partly, and this is partly due to groundwater pumping. So the flow in the river is declining rapidly. Um, and this is, we, we measure a seven day lowest flow in an attempt to approximate the base flow of the river. So let me explain what that means. This is a hydrograph. This is a record from USGS for that Paulding gauge. And you see that here's the dates on the x-axis. Here's 1964. Um, and then this is the flow in cubic feet per second. This is a logarithmic scale. So when you look at this graph, it looks like kind of a spiky mess. And this is typical of a Southwestern Desert River. Southwestern Desert Rivers don't have a steady flow like a montane river might. Instead, they have a base flow on the Verde is to say roughly 20 CFS, just to use a round number. The base flow is this bottom blue line. So that comes from groundwater. Um, Neighboring aquifers are leaking water into the river through springs. And so that's base flow. These spikes are flash floods that come from precipitation events. And some of these are pretty serious floods. Look at this one. Since the lifetime of the gauge, it was put in in fall of 1963. The record flow recorded is over 23,000 CFS. So let me put that in context. Do you know what the Colorado River flow is? Let's say from between, through the Grand Canyon. So uh, this would be what Lynn Canyon Dam releases. Okay, I'm, it's a rhetorical question, I'll answer it. So it would be between like eight and 12,000 CFS, depending on how much air conditioning is required in Phoenix. So, um, the record flood flow on the Verde was two to three Colorado rivers. This is a big flood. These floods can come up in half an hour. So it isn't like a giant wall of water, but it's a pretty sudden and severe increase in flow. Here's some uh, 10, 12,000 CFS floods. This happens um, a few times a decade. Um, so we have base flow and flood flow. And the base flow is what we're concerned about because that's what makes it a perennial stream. That's what the, uh, the fish and the wildlife depend upon is base flow. So there's this recording gauge from USGS, but the Sierra Club Water Sentinels monitors flow at many other spots that don't have a recording gauge. And some of this data is very, very important. Um, incidentally, if you want to help us with this, this is an ongoing effort. If you want to help us with this, volunteers are very welcome. And um, uh, you can email um, Water Sentinels Coordinator Jennifer.Martin at SierraClub.org. So at Perkinsville Bridge, we've been recording record low flows also. So um, here in uh, 2019 and uh, late July 2019, Paulden was at 16 CFS, Perkinsville Bridge was at nine. And so the river lost seven CFS on the way uh, down between the two gauges. And so I need to explain the significance of that. Roughly each year in, in late June, we're, we're seeing a maximum flow loss of seven CFS plus or minus something. All right, so here's, I know this is too busy, but this is, I wanna explain what's going on here. So here's the green line. This is the Verde, Verde River. This is a Google Earth view from about 60 miles up. And uh, so as we come up the river, here's Tavasi Marsh, here's Clarkdale, Cottonwood, here's Oak Creek. 
This is uh, Sycamore Canyon, and this is Perkinsville Bridge, the joint, the junction between the red and green lines. As you continue up the river to Verde Springs, Verde Springs at mile two on the river is the beginning of perennial flow. And Verde Springs is the sole source of water for the first 25 miles of the river. So if Verde Springs is flowing at 16 CFS here, by the time it gets down to Perkinsville Bridge, it's, it's down to nine CFS. There's, there's a big loss in flow. Um, this water seeps back into the riverbed all throughout here. So there's less flow here at Perkinsville than there is at Verde Springs. So if we get a record low flow of like nine CFS here at Perkinsville Bridge, anything that affects the flow at Verde Springs that reduces the flow at Verde Springs by nine CFS is gonna get you a dry river right here. That's a bad day if you're a speckled dace or a, um, a razorback sucker. So what is it then that could reduce the flow of Verde Springs? Well, it's groundwater pumping. There's two sub-basins that contribute flow to Verde Springs. One is the Little Chino watershed. So here's Chino Valley, Prescott, Prescott Valley. All of them are pumping water out of the Little Chino which contributes about 14% of the flow from Verde Springs. Um, this area, part of the Prescott Active Management Area is in severe overdraft, one of the worst AMAs in the state of Arizona. 18,000 acre feet is the overdraft. That's, we're pumping 18,000 acre feet of water more out of the ground than is running into the ground. 18,000 acre feet. That's a football field, three and a half miles deep in water every year is being removed from this aquifer. So groundwater levels fall, wells go dry, Del Rio Springs is almost dry. And the contribution of this watershed to the Verde River is sharply reduced. So groundwater pumping in the Little Chino watershed is capturing water that was destined to flow out of Verde Springs. Groundwater pumping captures stream flow. That's the hydrologic concept you got to keep in mind. Well, that's bad enough, but it gets worse. Here in the Big Chino Aquifer, 80 to 86 percent, uh, it supplies 80 to 86 percent of the flow from Verde Springs. So this is even more sensitive. Uh, groundwater pumping in the Big Chino uh, has a huge effect on the flow of the river. Groundwater pumping up here, you take one acre foot out of here, it's one less acre foot that flows down the river. So um, this first 25 miles is really threatened because Verde Springs is the only water source for that. This is some of the finest riparian habitat in the state of Arizona. Downstream from Perkinsville uh, Bridge, more water, groundwater comes in from the north. And so uh, the flow of the river could triple by the time it gets down in the Verde Valley. A lot of water comes into the river here. This first 25 miles is what we're really concerned about, and it's an important area. You don't have to drain the Big Chino to run the upper Verde Dry. Verde Springs is basically a leak off the top of the aquifer. So if groundwater pumping just lowers the water level in the Big Chino aquifer by 20 or 30 feet, Verde Springs is dry. So there's three classes of groundwater pumping that are of concern to us. I just wanna review these three. One is groundwater exports. The current base flow, well, when I did the slide, it was 8,000 acre feet per year is the current volume of water that would flow down the river from Verde Springs. <clears throat> um, Arizona water law permits, and it makes it legal to transport water from this watershed to this watershed. There's a special exception in Arizona water law to permit that. Um, the legal, the, about 18,000 acre feet per year is, is authorized for export. Um, Prescott and Prescott Valley uh, are on some land up here, they want to put in the Big Chino Water Ranch, build a pipeline, the yellow lines, 
pipelines designed to export 12,000 acre feet per year. You can compare that to the current river flow of 8,000 and doesn't take much math to see that this is an alone, is an existential threat for this river. Now Prescott and Prescott Valley have agreed that they would mitigate any harm to the base flow caused by their pumping. Um, but they haven't said a peep about that in 11 years. And we don't know how it's even possible to do it. So this looms as uh, a major threat. The second one is expanded irrigation. The big Chino Valley is, well, you can see now there's some agriculture up in here, um, but there's a lot more agricultural land and it's totally legal under Arizona water law for some, I don't know, grower from California or someplace to come in and plant a thousand acres of alfalfa and pump 5,000 acre feet of groundwater. You do that twice, you've killed the river. Uh, Kingman and Wilcox have each seen groundwater demands in excess of 25,000 acre feet per year by agriculture moving in from other regions. This is a responsibility of the Arizona legislature. Um, that's an existential threat. The third one is just development, growth and development. Uh, Paulden is uh, growing about 1.3% a year, growing up the valley. Um, do that for a hundred years, you can use a lot of water. We don't know if how much of that growth, how fast that growth will occur and how much will result, but so there's a huge range in potential demand, but the Board of Supervisors could control this. So there's three problems here, three classes of groundwater pumping, any one of which can kill the river. This is a huge problem. So who's responsible for this? It's a political problem. The Arizona legislature um, has declined to consider a solution to the expanded irrigation. They have declined to modernize water law to protect rivers. And they're the ones that authorized uh, interbasin transfers from the Big Chino to Prescott. The Avapai County Board of Supervisors has declined to use their existing zoning authorities to reduce consumptive uh, water use. Salt River Project has been helpful. They have um, um, are, are now taking actions to help produce uh, base flow. They have some senior water rights on the river and they wanna protect those rights. It, it's really nice as a, a conservationist to have um, a powerful group like Salt River Project uh, working parallel to you. But ultimately who's responsible is all of us. If you care about this, this river and about Arizona rivers, you know, the, the problems I've, I've laid out here about the Verde are not unique to the Verde. It, the, these problems are common throughout the Southwest in all states. If you care about these rivers and the biodiversity and the wildlife and the recreation and all that stuff, all the outstanding remarkable values, um, then I, I hope you would share in some of the solutions and help us solve these problems. Now, after all that horrible, the world is ending stuff, let me just go through a few good things here. I'm almost done. Um, there was an 83 acre parcel on the river that the Trust for Public Land helped transfer into Prescott National Forest. So private land to public land, um, this is an example of that kind of the character of that space. This was wonderful. This ranch was located in one of the best and prettiest and wildest parts of the river. So this is just awesome that this has happened. We gained public ownership of six tenths miles of river, 83 acres in a critical spot. So thank you to the Trust for Public Land. Uh, if you have a ch chance to support that organization or be a member, do it, they do great work. The Sierra Club Water Sentinels is also a bright spot on this whole thing. You know, uh, this is a citizen science group. Uh, they've been working on the Verde and the San Pedro and the Salt for years, but on the Verde, they've done water quality testing for nine attributes uh, every other month for, you know, over 10 years. And the conclusion is that the river meets the Clean Water Act standards for body contact. Verde's in good shape. You know, right now the water is good. 
the uh, it's, it's perennial, the habitat's in reasonable shape. We don't have a lot of invasive species, salt, cedar, and giant reed and that kind of stuff. That's, it's very clean for that. Right now, the river is really in good shape. That's the big good news. And this is just a, a repre repre one representation of that. Finally, the Sierra Club is applied to uh, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, that is ADEQ, <clears throat> for outstanding Arizona water status. This provides non-degradation of water quality for the river and is some recognition that this is really a quality and important stream. So um, that's, that should be approved at the next triennial, triennial review. Uh, by ADEQ of the status of surface waters in the state. Really a bright spot, this is what I'm really enthusiastic about is, uh, you know, President Biden released the America, the beautiful, the statement, um, supporting the idea that 30% of the US land area should be put into protected status by 2030. The shorthand for it's 20 is 30 by 30. So uh, a group of us have formed in the state to work on wild and scenic rivers. Um, so what we're doing is uh, first, um, there was a 1993 proposal that proposed wild and scenic rivers all over Arizona. So we're updating this and uh, gonna use that as the basis for uh, uh, subsequent proposals. Um, we wanna pro propose wild and scenic rivers statewide. Uh, that will probably happen in groups uh, by, by landscape scale, but um, we've got um, eight years to make a lot of progress on this. And whoops, sorry. Top priority for this uh, Wild and Scenic River Work Group is the Upper Verde. Um, and uh, this is, this work, it's very important that uh, American Rivers has entered into this with us and is a is going to be a key player in helping us achieve congressional designation of the Upper Verde. What we have to do next is to um, gather public support, acquire legislative sponsors, and then achieve congressional approval. So we're beginning that work now. The political environment has just changed with redistricting. Um, in Arizona, District 2. Uh, has been expanded now to include Yavapai County, this area here. The Verde is, lies in this area. It was formerly in Representative Gosar, Gosar's district. He's not a supporter of public land. And so it, that was a major obstacle to getting this proposal into Congress. But with the redistricting, um, uh, Representative O'Halloran, if he is reelected, uh, uh, is is amenable to to bringing this into Congress. I've already been in conversations with his staff about this, and um, I think this is has a good poss possibility. Representative Gosar is moving over to Arizona's west coast into this new District Nine. All this takes effect in January 23 after the 2022 elections. So the political environment has changed. Um, and public opinion has really changed. This is uh, the Arizona summary page out of Colorado College's State of the Rockies project. They've done an annual poll on conservation, uh, public conservation attitudes for um, 12 years. Um, so this is the one that was just, this was just released yesterday. 78% of the Arizona people support supporting a national goal of 30 by 30. 87% support created new national parks, monuments, wildlife refuges, and by extension, wild and scenic rivers. 92% agree that, percent agree that even with state budget problems, the state should protect the state's land, water, and wildlife. Um, action on climate change is strongly uh, protected. So the whole situation, uh, that is public attitude, um, um, the electoral situation is changing now. These things can change rapidly and we wanna be ready with these wild and scenic river proposals in Congress. We wanna be there when the situation changes and take immediate advantage of it. So one just last look at to remind you of what we're 
working on here. Um, this, this river is an amazing place. Not only is it pretty, but it's alive. You know, um, the Yavapai Apache elder, Vincent Randall, told me uh, once that um, he added an 11th reason. I have a, a, a little op-ed that says 10 reasons to protect the Verde. And he added an 11th reason to it. He said, you need to add reason number 11. That, you should protect it because the river is alive. So our, our indigenous people um, attributed aspects of personhood of life to natural features. Vincent told me that if somebody uh, asked him where the river is, he wouldn't say, well, it's Southeast or something, he would say, in Apache, he would say the river lives over there. So uh, we need living rivers. And here's a great one right in the middle of Arizona, a perfect candidate for the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And so I hope that you all will help us protect Arizona rivers. Volunteer with the Water Sentinels. <clears throat> you can volunteer with the 30 by 30 Wild and Scenic Rivers team. We need in, in coming months, we will need um, uh, local experts from all over the state of Arizona to look at rivers. You can contact uh, me or Jennifer or anybody to, uh, to volunteer for that. So this is the last slide. I wanna just give you an opportunity to learn more about this uh, at this website, cwagaz.org. Right on the homepage, you can there's a link where you can view a one hour documentary movie, Viva La Verde, that I created. Um, to, it goes over much of what I talked about today. Um, and you can download the op-ed 10 Reasons to Protect the Verde, which I should update to make 11 reasons. So I'll leave this up here for a moment for you to um, maybe write down this um, web address. And um, I'm open for questions. Great, um, thanks Gary um, for this presentation and all the information you've given us and for all you do for the Birdie River. And I believe Tricia is now monitoring the chat and may have some questions for you. Yes, there were um, questions all along. Let me see if I can get back to some of the first ones. Here's that web page, uh, cwagaz.org. And if you go to it, you'll see links here to those two resources. So uh, curl up with your family for a one hour documentary on the river. A lot of good photography and it's, uh, it'll be uh, a pleasant evening. Gary, Tom Sands has a couple of questions. Good. Uh, first, wanted to know if there are bridges or fords currently used by the public, ranchers, or landowners that would be affected by the designation. There's uh, one bridge at Perkinsville, which is roughly in the middle of the corridor that we are, are proposing. Uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act permits um, and emit in a scenic section, which is where that is, uh, an occasional bridge or crossing is permitted. Otherwise, there are no uh, fords or crossings or bridges. This is a really remote and wild area. It's hard to get to, you know, uh, which is why the public doesn't know about it much. Tom also wanted to know where is the USGS Paulden gauge located relative to the SRP measuring wheels? So at um, <clears throat> River Mile Zero, legally speaking these days, is at Sullivan Dam. Um, Perennial flow on the river begins at mile two, which is where Verde Springs is. Um, Salt River Project built a low flow gauge at mile 3.2. Um, and they did that to have a 
careful measurement of the output from Verde Springs. The USGS Paulding gauge is at mile 9.8, and that was located um, at the downstream extreme of the Upper Verde watershed so that um, they could measure the output from the watershed as a whole. So those are the locations. Um, I kind of roughly pointed to those on the map and I could bring that map up again quickly if you, anyone wants to see it. Um, there were some other questions that um, I may have been able to steer Tom to the USGS report. He was asking about where some of the numbers came from for, for pumping and springs and discharge and all that. Um, Umberto asked about the Trace Rios Festival. So I gave him a link to Audubon Southwest where apparently they are planning um, a festival this year. Um, well, um, Tom, Tom had a question there that I think is important to address. What's the source of estimates of Verde Springs contributions from the big and little Chino basins. I said that 14% of Verde Springs flow comes from the little Chino and 80 to 86% comes from the big Chino. Uh, those are numbers from uh, USGS uh, scientific report uh, peer reviewed and published. Yeah, and I think I gave him the link to that. So. Oh, great, thanks Trish. All right. And then questions about the recording, but Chris said, of course, it would be available. Um, it'll be on the SWAN website, but maybe other places too. Yeah, um, Sandy Barr from the Sierra Club has been putting them on a YouTube um, place. Yeah. And um, yes, um, so this link along with the others will be um, distributed. Okay. So again, I wanna thank you, Gary, for all the information tonight. And again, for all you do for the Verde River and for everyone else for um, tuning in. And for this river series, we did um, have the uh, Gila River uh, scheduled for next month for March. Um, but because of the COVID situation um, in the Gila Indian River community, they're a little behind in their uh, presentation. So the March River Series um, presentation, speaker and river um, is yet to be determined. Um, but as soon as we know, I will send that um, information out. So again, if there are no more questions, then I wanna thank everybody for um, tuning in tonight and thank you for all you do for the environment in Arizona and for rivers in particular. And, and I wanna thank you all for tuning in to learn about this river. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at uh, gbverde99 at gmail.com. Maybe Trish can throw that in the chat for you. Um, but if you wanna communicate more, I'm, I'm willing, thanks. All right, thank you everyone and good night. Okay, good night. Hey, Gary, what was that uh, email address for you again? Um, let me, I'll just put it in the chat. There you go. Can you get it out of there? The chat gets uh, recorded, so. Just say it again, GB Verdi. Gary B. Beverly, GB. G Golf Bravo. Verde, as in the river, right? right? 99 at gmail.com. Gmail. Okay, got it. And Thank that's you. in the chat. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy your evening. Good night.